This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. That's what I'm going to be talking about in a nutshell, is how do we understand atypical cognitive development? And I'm going to present a framework for understanding it uh, that I've developed and others have developed. And then I'm going to illustrate it with some specific disorders that we've worked on a lot. So the, t the talk title is uh, analyzing comorbidity with genetic and cognitive methods. So let me unpack that title just a little bit. Uh, so what's comorbidity? Uh, that may sound like a big technical term for some people. It's actually a very simple concept. It just means that uh, for behaviorally, well, it means the co-occurrence of two disorders. And in um, standard medicine, it's not super common because people have a better uh, understanding of the underlying me mechanisms of disorders. And, but for behaviorally defined disorders, co-occurrence is more the rule than the exception. So if you do epidemiologic surveys with the DSM and diagnose a, a random population sample of either adults or kids, you will find that over half of those that have one diagnosis have two. So comorbidity or co-occurrence of disorders is more the rule than the exception. So as we study individual disorders, we have to also be thinking about why are they related to other disorders? Uh, this is true for autism, of course, which is comorbid with uh, attention problems, anxiety, OCD. It's true for dyslexia, as I'm going to tell you about. It's true for lots of psychiatric disorders. And one of the things we're learning from breakthroughs in genetics and imaging is that there's some shared uh, underlying pathways that help produce these comorbidities. OK, here's an outline of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to first tell you some evidence for comorbidity, uh, talk about why it's important. I'm going to give diagnostic definitions of the disorders that I'm going to focus on. Um, I'm going to then talk about uh, cognitive methods for understanding these comorbidities and what we've learned from them. And then I'm going to talk about genetic methods for understanding these comorbidities and what we've learned. And then I'm going to give you conclusions. So first of all, why should we care about comorbidity? Well, I've already explained that it's super common among behaviorally defined disorders. So it's at the outset a puzzle that we need to understand. Um, but it's also clinically important because if you see a child and they have two disorders and you only diagnose one, you may be missing a very important part of what they need in terms of treatment. So let's say you see a kid who's got who seems to have oppositional defiant disorder, and that's very salient because it's causing lots of problem for everybody, and you only treat that and you miss the fact that he's also dyslexic, then you've missed an important target for treatment. And some of his, maybe not all, of his ODD symptoms might be coming from the frustration of not knowing how to read. Another important reason to study comorbidity is, has to do with how we categorize behaviorally defined or mental disorders. Uh, and that's what taxonomic means. Taxonomies are just classification systems. And um, right now, some, you know, it's very important to remember that the DSM is a human uh, 
pro uh, product that's anchored in a particular time and is hammered out in smoke-filled rooms with lots of <laughs> controversy, and it may not be the final state of the field. And so as we make scientific progress, some of the disorders that we think of as separate may be clumped together in the future, and some disorders um, that um, we think of as one thing may break into subtypes, so they may split. Um, and so our future diagnostic schemes will change as a result of the science that's going on. Uh, a good example of this kind of thing is uh, for the long time in the history of psychiatry, depression and anxiety were considered to be pretty separate disorders. And then it turned out that there's a lot of comorbidity between the two. If you're treating depression, you should always be looking for anxiety symptoms and vice versa. And it also turned out that the genetic influences uh, on each symptom dimension turned out to be correlated at one. And so, in other words, the genetic liability for anxiety or depression is the same thing. <laughs> That's a profound thing, right? But that there can be symptomatically different, and so there must be environmental things that distinguish, that take this underlying liability and push it one way or the other. And we have some understanding of what those environmental risk factors are. So loss is a huge risk factor for depression whereas threat uh, is a big risk factor for anxiety. So in the future, we might not have separate di diagnoses for depression and anxiety. We might have hyperactive amygdala syndrome. So just a little joke, okay. <laughs> um, and most importantly, why are comorbidities important is they can provide insights into the neurobiology and development of disorders. So as we, if we understand the reasons for comorbidities, we're gonna get information about how disorders develop and, develop and what the underlying etiologic and brain mechanisms are behind them. Okay, when you study comorbidity, uh, it turns out to be somewhat complicated and people have laid out different explanatory models for why a comorbidity might happen. And so, and some of these are artifacts, and some of them are actually causal. And so, it's incumbent on you, if you're gonna study a comorbidity, to rule out the artifacts before you dig really deeply into possible causal explanations, which take a lot of time. Uh, first of all, Behaviorally defined disorders all have pretty high prevalences, most in excess of 1%, and so by chance alone, two disorders will uh, co-occur some, some portion of the time. And so if you have a comorbidity you're really excited about that you've seen in a clinic, you better make sure that it, it occurs in a population sample and not just in a clinical sample, and that the rate of comorbidity is greater than chance. So like for dyslexia and ADHD, let's say each one of them has a prevalence of 10%, then the rate of comorbidity better be higher than 1%, right? That's the product of the two prevalences. And it is, as it turns out. Um, there are also artifactual reasons, other artifactual reasons for comorbidity. Uh, there's referral bias, uh, one of which is Berkson's bias. That just means that if you're looking at a clinically ascertained sample, you're going to get more comorbid cases. Uh, for the DSM disorders, there's rater biases. So if the diagnosis is based on parent report or teacher report, if you have the same rater, evaluating all the possible diagnoses, you can get halo effects or suppression effects or, you know, some, I, all of you have seen this in clinic, I'm sure a parent comes in, if they're really worried about their kid and you give them the CBCL, then they, what you learn is my child has everything. Just means I'm really freaked out about my kid. Um, 
So you want to make sure that the comorbidity is not just due to radar biases. Um, another possibility is definitional overlap. Uh, a lot of symptoms in the DSM are uh, shared across disorders. They may have different meaning and a different explanation in some of the disorders, but the actual symptom is shared. So that, uh, at a descriptive level, means that there's inevitably going to be some comorbidity just because of overlapping symptoms. Uh, some folks did a, what's called a graph analysis of dsm 4 which is a way to show the uh, clustering of things in a multidimensional space. And sure enough, there were huge overlapping clusters defined by symptoms in dsm 4 So uh, just at the level of uh, shared symptoms, a lot of disorders are going to be related. Uh, so you would like, when you study this, to make sure that the way you're defining the disorders uh, uses different methods. That would be ideal. You're not relying on the same rater or define one disorder by a cognitive test and another one by a different method. Uh, comorbidities can occur in subsets of the population and may not be characteristic of the general population. Uh, we, one sort of weird possibility we've studied is maybe there's non-random mating. Uh, we kind of hope there's non-random mating in general, but there may be non-random mating among parents uh, who, let's say, a mother with ADHD is more likely to pick a husband with dyslexia. Maybe they were in classes together or something. So if that happens and both disorders are genetically transmitted, their child has a higher rate of comorbidity, not for any causal reason besides the fact that there was non-random mating or cross-assortment, you could call this. So we've tested that actually as an explanation for some of the comorbidities we've studied and not found it. Um, so for the things I'm going to tell you about, these are genuine comorbidities. They're, we've ruled out the artifacts uh, for all of them. And so there must, what that leaves is that there's some causal relation between the disorders. And here are some of the possibilities for causal relations where the comorbidity really is genuine. Uh, it could be the two disorders are just different points on the same liability continuum. So an example of this would be like um, uh, major depression and dysphoria, I guess. So I may not be using the right word, but I think you know what I mean. Uh, so there's just this one liability distribution, but if you're only this far out, you know, you have dysphoria, but if you're this far out, you have major depression. What that implies is you're not going to see any cases of major depression without dysphoria also, right? So you can only get uh, these combinations of disorders out of this explanation. Uh, another possibility is the two disorders partly share an etiology, either genetic or environmental, and it's not, uh, so it's not entirely the same liability distribution, but the liabilities overlap, and so, so they share some genetic or environmental risk factors, but not all. Then you could get all three subtypes out of this explanation. You could get kids that only have disorder A or disorder B, but then some will become morbid and have both. And the reason I bolded this is because this turns out, after all this work, to be the most common explanation, at least for the comorbidities we've studied. And I think it's pretty likely to be common across lots of other comorbidities, especially once you rule out the artifacts. So we should be looking for etiologic factors that produce risk for more than one disorder. On the environmental side, we already know one of those, right? So uh, traumatic stress is a huge risk factor for a bunch of things. <laughs> Poverty is a huge risk factor for a bunch of things, right? So you can think of uh, poor parenting as a huge risk factor for a bunch of things. 
On the genetic side, it's turning out that the candidate genes we're identifying uh, for certain disorders uh, are implicated often in other disorders. So there's some genetic overlap between disorders. Uh, and I'm going to tell you more about that for the disorders I study. But it's true, some of the autism genes are turning out to be implicated in other things. Uh, and some of the schizophrenia genes are, and so on and so on. So, it, you know, as much as we'd like to think so, uh, the disorders in DSM are not a product of natural selection. So. They're not encoded in the genome, right? Um, another possibility is there could be three distinct disorders, each one of which has a different etiology. So disorder A could have its own separate etiology, disorder B could have its own separate etiology, and the comorbid subtype is distinct from either one of those. It has a third separate etiology. And then a final possibility is one disorder could influence the development of another. Okay. Um, in thinking about comorbidity, one of the things that happened in my thinking and the thinking of our group is that a model that we had been pursuing for a long time in our research on autism and dyslexia and ADHD, uh, this was kind of the holy grail for a lot of people studying disorders back in the 70s and 80s was a single deficit model, and the idea was there would be one cognitive cause for ADHD and another cognitive cause for autism and another cognitive cause for dyslexia. And that was a, a good hypothesis to pursue because it's the most parsimonious one, but it's wrong. So <laughs> it was hard to give it up. <laughs> But the comorbidity is part of why we gave it up, because uh, if the single deficit model is true and each disorder is completely distinct neuropsychologically from other disorders, then they shouldn't be comorbid, right? They should be in their own little box. And so I tried to come up with a different model from the single deficit model to think about the development of disorders and their relationship. And this was published in Cognition in 2006 and is called a multiple deficit model. And I, I'm not, I'm, I, it's really very simple even though it looks, maybe looks confusing. So let me just walk you through this. So one of the things about this model is it just has levels of analysis over here. Uh, I think most of the field at this point recognizes we need multiple levels of analysis to understand neurodevelopmental disorders, and that we can't just reduce uh, these, you know, all of these levels down to just one level, like etiology or brain or whatever. That all the, all the levels are important in a full understanding of the disorder. Um, and so the levels are etiology, which are genetic and environmental risk and protective factors. And those factors don't act always independently. That's what the double-headed arrows are for. They might be correlated with each other or they might interact with each other. Um, then there are neural systems that are influenced, whose development is influenced by these etiologic factors. And they're not totally independent either, despite what we used to think. Those things produce cognitive deficits. Those are the C's here that are somewhat correlated. And then those cognitive risk factors produce symptoms that define disorders. So these are the D's are disorders that are defined by symptoms. So there's four levels here, uh, and there should be arrows across all of them, and then it'd be an impossible figure. So that's why. That's why there's not arrows, but it's really quite simple, this model. Uh, all it's saying is that uh, behaviorally defined disorders are often comorbid, and the explanation for their comorbidity just lies in shared etiologic and neural and cognitive risk factors. So the trajectories that lead to a given disorder cross at different points in development. 
in these levels of development, across these levels. Okay, I'm gonna now give you definitions of the disorders we're studying, and, uh, and then we'll move into cognitive methods for understanding comorbidity and genetic methods. Um, this is a definition I helped contribute to. Uh, the International Dyslexia Association pulled together uh, researchers who are funded by NICHD to come up with the definition of dyslexia for the IDA. And we all thought, oh, they, they really need this because that's what the name of their organization is. And they'll be really happy when we produce a definition. So this is the definition we came up with. And it's uh, pretty standard. I mean, I, a lot of people would agree with this definition across the research and mostly clinical commu communities. Um, the important point of this definition is that dyslexia is a problem with single word reading, basically. It's not a problem primarily with reading comprehension. So it's a real simple disorder in that sense. Its defining characteristic is that you're just bad at reading single words, either in accuracy or fluency, or both. That's it. It has other characteristics that are associated with it, and once you have it, it can lead to other things like uh, not building as big a vocabulary, and you know it can have widening impacts on your development. But that's it. That's problems in single word reading, if you want to. Well, we presented this to the IDA at a meeting, and we were nearly tarred and feathered because there are lots of practitioners in that organization that said, that's not what I call dyslexia, and that's not what I'm treating in my practice. And because they were also treating, and this makes sense actually, they were treating a lot of comorbid things. They were treating ADHD, and they're treating math disability, and they're treating a lot of other stuff. So we are very naive scientists that found out that our efforts were not appreciated. So, but it's pretty important in science to have a definition of what you're studying, right? So that's what we were trying to do. Um, okay. Another disorder I'm going to talk about is speech sound disorder. Uh, this is in the DSM-4 and DSM-5. And this, just very simply, are, is a disorder in which kids are bad at articulating words in their language development, and they're bad enough at it that it impairs their comprehensibility. People don't understand what they're saying. All kids make pronunciation errors, right, when they're developing speech, and some of them are very cute. Uh, but some kids are making uh, so many that it's quite frustrating for them and their parents because they can't understand them a lot of the time. Um, so that's what speech sound disorder is, and we just use a descriptive label for it instead of calling it articulation disorder or phonological disorder because those labels imply we know the cognitive cause, that it's a motor problem or it's a phonological representation problem. And the important thing about the DSM is that it should really be, or try to be, neutral about cognitive causes at this point in our science. It should be just descriptive. So anyway, this is a fairly common developmental disorder. It's distinct partly from dyslexia. Um, it has a different course than dyslexia. It appears earlier in development. And for a lot of children who have this diagnosis, uh, maybe 75% of them, it goes away by the time they're about six. Maybe partly because they get treated. But so it's not as persistent a disorder uh, as dyslexia or some of the other disorders I'm going to talk about. But it is comorbid with dyslexia, and it's comorbid with some other things, too. Here are some of the kind of errors that these kids make. Uh, they omit uh, speech sounds from words they're saying. They substitute speech sounds, or they do both. And so you can see some of these uh, things would just be cute, but some of them would really make it hard for you to know what the kid's talking about. <laughs> 
Another disorder I'm going to talk about is language impairment. This used to be called specific language impairment and still is by some people. Uh, and I'll say why it isn't anymore in a second. Uh, this is basically a delay in language, spoken language development. Uh, speech sound disorder is also a problem with spoken language development, but it's more specific to the correct pronunciation, whereas this extends across lots of aspects of language. Uh, and uh, it's an early onset disorder, just like speech sound disorder is, but it's a much more persistent disorder. So a kid who meets this diagnosis as a preschooler is very likely to have continuing problems into adulthood with language. So it's a more serious disorder because of that. Um, and these kids are having trouble developing one or more aspects of spoken language. Um, they're having trouble learning the forms of words. Uh, they have trouble with syntax. They may be very bad at acquiring uh, past tense or possessive forms of words. Uh, and they very often have reduced vocabularies. They speak later. Their mean length of utterance is lower. Uh, and they're at very high risk for academic problems because those are based so heavily on language skill. The reason it isn't called specific language impairment anymore is uh, similar to why dyslexia isn't called, why we don't use an IQ discrepancy to define dyslexia. So the old idea was that you couldn't be dyslexic unless your reading was significantly below what your IQ predicts. Well, that uh, was tested very thoroughly empirically by comparing kids who met an IQ discrepancy with those that didn't but were still poor at reading. And there wasn't any, uh, there wasn't a cognitive difference between those two subtypes. There didn't seem to be a big genetic difference between those two subtypes. The response to treatment or the treatments that were helpful were similar. And so people in the dyslexia field said this isn't a valid distinction, uh, it, you know, that there's one kind of dyslexia and it's just kids that read single words poorly and they can sometimes be below their IQ level and sometimes not. And so people in the language impairment field said, well, we should be asking the same question. Are the kids that meet the definition for specific language impairment and it used an IQ discrepancy with nonverbal IQ, not just full-scale IQ, uh, are the ones that meet this specific profile where their language is a lot worse than their nonverbal IQ, are they different at other levels of analysis from kids whose language is delayed but it isn't discrepant from nonverbal IQ? And the answer again was no. So one, you might have two kids in a family or members of a twin pair, one has LI that's nonverbal IQ discrepant, but the other one has just got low language. So, so that's why we don't use any more IQ discrepancies as a requirement for defining dyslexia or LI. Unfortunately, what's happened in the DSM-5, uh, despite the best efforts of myself and others, is now that they, now it's turned into, it's gone from requiring an IQ discrepancy to just uh, leaving that out of the definition completely, and now you can only be dyslexic if you're age discrepant. So we went from discriminating against kids with lower IQs who were poor readers who couldn't get services, and now what we're doing is discriminating against bright dyslexic kids who have average reading, but uh, whose IQ is much higher. I think that's is also an injustice, and I protested like crazy, and we had persuaded them right up to the final draft to uh, make it an OR criterion, and then mysteriously that disappeared in the final DSM. So I just continue to protest. The DSM is wrong, so you can, <laughs> on that point. Um, because I, you know, in my clinical practice, I see lots of kids uh, who uh, 
are bright dyslexics who are, have clinical impairment because they're having trouble with reading and spelling, and they deserve to be identified and treated just like other kids do have reading problems. Move along here. This slide is a little bit hyperactive. And so these are the symptoms of ADHD. It's defined by symptoms of inattention and hyperactivity and impulsivity. I'm not going to talk a lot about that. And how do we know that there is comorbidity among these disorders, these four disorders I've talked about? Uh, well, we have a lot of evidence from epidemiologic studies that they are uh, comorbid. I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail. Uh, one interesting little thing is speech sound disorder and dyslexia. There are kids with speech sound disorder who uh, have a phonological deficit, they're bad at phoneme awareness, but they don't go on to become dyslexic. And when we discovered this, this was part of the reason we switched to a multiple deficit model. We said, if single deficit model is true, these kids with early phoneme awareness problems have to be dyslexic, and they weren't. And it turned out that if a kid has speech sound disorder, uh, but they don't also have language impairment, they don't go on to be dyslexic. So the comorbidity between dyslexia and speech sound disorder is, seems to be fully mediated by uh, language impairment. Okay, and then there's an interestingly similar pattern for speech sound disorder and ADHD that kids who have speech sound disorder only uh, aren't at higher risk for ADHD, but they are if they're comorbid with language impairment. So you can see that teasing apart these patterns of comorbidity is tricky and sometimes involves thinking about not just two disorders, but three disorders. Here's just a figure, a Venn diagram of what the phenotypic or symptom overlap among these disorders might look like. Uh, so then you have kids that uh, only have one disorder, but you have kids that have two or three or all four. And so what we're trying to do in the research is explain why this happens. You know, what cognitive risk factors produce comorbidity among these things? What etiologic risk factors produce it? What brain mechanisms are producing this? And so in terms of shared cognitive risk factors, here are some candidates uh, for ones that seem to cut across disorders. Uh, phonological problems are found in all three of the language-based disorders, dyslexia, speech sound disorder, and language impairment. And forgive the, all these acronyms. So PA means phonological awareness. Uh, PM means phonological memory, which is usually measured with non-word repetition. Um, PS up there under dyslexia means processing speed. And what we mean by this is really what's sometimes called perceptual speed, but it's also called processing speed, like in the WISC, where there's a processing speed index that's defined by coding and symbol search. So these are speeded tasks, but they're not just reaction time. They're tasks where you have to scan an array of things and make decisions and uh, pick things that fit with something else. And this is a very robust uh, psychometric factor, and it's also interesting because so many disorders, uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, have deficits in processing speed. So we think it's really important to understand why. Uh, it's also interesting because processing speed develops very, has very huge developmental effects. Uh, Rob Kale's shown this very nicely, and those developmental effects cut across contents. In other words, the same developmental function seems to be driving speed increases across verbal and spatial and various other tasks. So it looks like there's a general speed factor that's increasing in development, and sadly, uh, for me and others, uh, is declining in age. <laughs> and then there's white matter associations with processing speed. So 
white matter pathologies really impair processing speed. Multiple sclerosis, you know, take a big hit on processing speed. Um, so part of the brain mechanisms for processing speed seem to be in the development of white matter connectivity, which would make sense that if you're going to go fast at something, your brain has to be well integrated and efficient, right? All the different parts need to be talking to each other well. So we're real interested in delving more into the brain mechanisms behind processing speed. Um, and you know, some people don't like processing speed. They say, oh, it's just cognitive control. It's just an executive function. I'm pretty sure that's not right based on a lot of psychometric data. They don't just, you know, if you partial out executive functions, you don't get rid of processing speed. Um, OK, rapid serial naming is related closely to processing speed, but it's different because you have to name uh, objects that are in, laid out in a print-like array. They could be colors or numbers or objects or uh, even letters. And Martha Dinkla developed this test a long time ago. And it's well known to be a predictor, among others, of reading. Vocabulary just means vocabulary. And inhibition means inhibition. Neuropsych tests like the stop signal task. And SDRT means standard deviation of reaction time. So those, those two latter two things are cognitive predictors of ADHD. So if we want to explain the comorbidity among these disorders with, cognitive, with shared cognitive risk factors, we need to identify some cognitive risk factors that are common across disorders. And so we're pretty sure, I'm not going to show you a lot of data on this, that part of the reason for comorbidity among language impairment, uh, dyslexia, and SSD is some shared kind of phonologic problem, which makes a lot of sense. Um, you need to develop phonological representations to learn spoken language, and the quality of those phonological representations also affect how well you're going to do with a written language, because an alphabet really is a code that maps printed letters onto phonemes, right? But some of the other comorbidities aren't as straightforward. One that's kind of puzzling on the face of it is why is ADHD comorbid with dyslexia? So we spent a lot of time trying to figure that out. Because they're not, it's not an obvious comorbidity, right? ADHD is not a language disorder. Dyslexia is. Why should they be comorbid? And I, frankly, for a long time, I didn't believe it was a genuine comorbidity. And so I had to do a bunch of these studies to prove to myself that it was. And then I started digging in to try to understand it. Okay, I'm going to say a little bit more about uh, dyslexia, and then we'll get back to the shared cognitive mechanisms. Uh, so like a lot of behaviorally defined disorders, uh, there's, uh, dyslexia is not really a category. I mean, we have to use it that way in clinical work. But reading is continuously distributed, and so they're uh, like obesity or hypertension or other things in medicine. Uh, there's, an under, there's a continuous distribution of the symptom, and then we have to arbitrarily, somewhat arbitrarily, set a cutoff for what counts as who's got the disorder, right? Who needs intervention, you know? And so it's, you know, so saying what the prevalence of dyslexia is always depends on, at this point, what your cutoff is, right? But a commonly used cutoff is maybe 7%. Um, there's slightly more boys than girls. It's, we've done a lot of work on why that is, but I'm not going to go into it right now. But um, in clinical samples, the sex ratio was much more highly skewed to boys. And so what that means clinically is really important is there are a lot of little girls and big girls who have dyslexia out there who've never been identified and never got services. So that's a problem. <laughs> uh, dyslexia for most lay people is still thought of as a visual disorder, isn't that when you see things backwards? Uh, if that were true, we would hope the DMV wouldn't be giving out driver's lesson, <laughs> licenses to dyslexics, but it's not seeing things backwards. Um, and Frank Velatino showed this very convincingly 
by having dyslexics and non-dyslexics uh, try to remember uh, letter strings. And if the letter strings were in their own language, in English in this case, the dyslexics were much worse in remembering all the letters and their order than the non-dyslexics. But if the letters were not familiar linguistically to either group, they performed identically. So if your problem is visual, you ought to have trouble with any uh, letters, right? Not just the letters of your own language for which you know the phonology. So, and these subjects uh, weren't going to Hebrew classes, so they didn't know Hebrew letters. So. so we've known for a long time that this is not a visual disorder, even though that's still the stereotype that's out there. It's really a language disorder. And one of the key things you see clinically for dyslexia is that dyslexics are bad at reading uh, pseudo words or non words. So, this is a test we often give diagnostically in our clinic the Woodcock Johnson word attack. Um, and the stimuli, stimulus words are on the left, and then on the right are what uh, some dyslexics actually said. And you can see that a lot of the time they're turning what they've been told is a, a nonsense word or not a real word. They're turning that into a real word. They're lexicalizing the stimulus. So we call these lexicalization errors. It just means turning it into a real word. Uh, so why are they doing that? Well, if you can't sound out uh, letters because you have poor phoneme awareness and you don't know how letters map onto speech sounds, you're going to have to do something when somebody shows you uh, a pseudo word and the thing that's left to you is basically to say, what real word does this remind me of and that I already know? And then you'll say, okay, I'll say fit, you know, because it's got all the right letters there. Uh, so these errors show that dyslexics are bad at phonological decoding or phonics. Uh, okay, uh, a little bit more about reading science, and then we're going to... Obviously, the goal of reading is reading comprehension, but notice that we're not calling somebody dyslexic because they're bad at reading comprehension. That's not part of the definition. And there are kids out there that are bad at reading comprehension, but not at single word reading. And we have a different name for those kids. They're called poor comprehenders, and there's a whole bunch of research on them. Uh, and the reason for their, and they often have language impairment, for instance. The reason for their problems are somewhat different from dyslexia. So the earlier, the DSM 4 unfortunately mixed these two things up and said that you could be. Uh, have dyslexia or reading disability either with a problem in single word reading or with reading comprehension. That's just wrong. That doesn't fit the science. So it, fortunately, that was one thing the DSM-5 did right. They changed that. So, okay. So we're tr when we read, we're trying to comprehend, and we and reading comprehension itself is very complicated cognitive process. And so we can break it down into subcomponents. And two very important subcomponents are being fluent at reading single words. That continues to predict reading comprehension well into adulthood. So even in this room, if I measured your single word reading skill, it would be a good predictor, not a perfect one, of how good you are at reading comprehension. It makes sense because if you're not automatic at single word reading, you have less, fewer cognitive resources left over to spend figuring out what the text means and forming a mental representation of the text. And in children, this is a, an early childhood. This is the main predictor of reading comprehension. Listening comprehension is another very important predictor of reading comprehension. And these two things together form what is called the simple model of reading comprehension because they predict a ton of variance in reading comprehension. And it makes sense. So to understand a written text, you have to be able to read the individual words, and you have to have enough language skills to put those words together so that you understand what they're saying, right? What the, 
sentences mean and how well you process spoken sentences and paragraphs, listening comprehension is a good measure for what your you know, language understanding is. Uh, I put one other thing out here, which is if you're trying to understand something that's longer than a conversation, like this long-winded talk, then you need some other language processing skills, which are called discourse comprehension skills. So you have to, to really understand a chapter or parts, a whole book or a, a spoken discourse like a lecture, you have to be doing a lot more than just understanding sentences. You have to be forming a mental representation of the whole discourse and making inferences and connections and so forth. Okay, and then these components have different lower level cognitive components and even developmental precursors, which I've shown here. I'm probably not gonna go through all of this because I'm gonna run out of time, but anyway, this has been written up in various places. This does show uh, how things that are characteristic of language impairment are going to affect listening comprehension. And so that's why you'd expect kids with language impairment to be bad at reading comprehension. Uh, and some of them are bad at reading comprehension without being dyslexic. They're, in other words, they're not so bad at single word reading, but they're really bad at comprehending what they read. And some kids have both problems, uh, for sure. Okay. Um, so what is this phonological awareness we keep talking about? It's the ability to manipulate and attend to individual sounds and words, which are phonemes. And we use this with, we measure this with various pretty simple tasks. Uh, sometimes when I give this lecture, we find some people in the audience who have problems with phoneme awareness, but I'm, I'm not going to embarrass anybody. So how many sounds are in the word cat? I'm now scared everybody. Three. Okay. Good. That's correct. There's three separate phonemes in cat. But how about in the word check? It looks like there might be five, right? But it's three again because... Uh, some, there's, if you say it and think about how it sounds, it's got ch, uh, ka, right? It's just that some of the phonemes are written, represented by more than one letter, right, in Czech. Um, an even harder one is uh, you can d subtract phonemes from a spoken word and say what would result, so fixed without the ka, Fist, good, great. That one's not, that one's a little subtle, right? That's a little tough. Anyway, when you give these kind of tasks, the developmentally appropriate versions of them to kids before school, uh, they are strong predictors, how well they do on these are strong predictors of how well they learn to read. And um, they're not the only predictor, uh, but they're a strong predictor. Uh, and somebody who's dyslexic is bad at this, and they're worse than their reading age level, not just than their chronological age level, and their problem with it persists into adulthood. So this is a very persisting feature of dyslexia. We and others have demonstrated that adults with dyslexia, college students, you know, bright people with dyslexia are still bad at phoneme awareness. Oh, and what's funny backwards? Enough, good. Okay, so why is this important for learning to read? I've sort of explained this, but just when you learn how an alphabet works, you have to map the letters, the written letters on, you have to understand the written letters stand for something. And they don't stand for units of meaning, they don't stand for syllables, they don't stand for demisyllables. Uh, they stand for phonemes. And so when you learn to read and you learn to decode words, you're learning uh, this code that a written alphabet provides whereby individual letters mostly stand for single phonemes. So if you lack this phoneme awareness, you're going to have trouble learning how an alphabet works and learning how to decode. So 
That's one of the causes of dyslexia. Uh, but there's other problems in dyslexia. One is rapid naming things. Like I've mentioned, this is just st s sample stimuli for ra uh, a rapid naming test. Also, dyslexics, before they ever encounter print, are making subtle speech errors, uh, some of which are reversing the order of sounds in words, uh, like saying, uh, or coming up with a, uh, yeah, a word that sounds similar, saying volcano for tornado, saying um, aminals for animals, saying uh, paschetti, saying uh, lisdexia to talk about themselves. Actually, that one comes from parents with dyslexia. That's kind of funny. If you just, you tell it, you're in a parent conference, you explain to the parents that their kid has dyslexia, and the parent says, oh, lisdexia, I never thought of that. So then you sort of know, well, maybe they had it too, right? So, um, And reading uh, has been also thoroughly investigated by cognitive scientists, and we have neural network models of learning to read that reproduce many of the phenomenon shown in typical reading development and in dyslexic reading development. So our cognitive understanding of dyslexia is very, very good. I mean, compared to other behaviorally defined disorders, I would argue maybe we understand it better than any other disorder out there. Um, and this is just a connectionist model called the triangle model that came from Mark Seidenberg and Jay McClelland, and has, it's a very, a very influential model. I'm not going to go into all the detail of it, but trust me, you can set this model up on a computer and get it to learn how to read. Uh, it's pretty cool. And then you can use this model as a, uh, an experimental subject and do things to it you can't do to children. So you can lesion it before it learns how to read, or you can lesion it afterwards, and you get acquired dyslexia. So it's very cool in terms of our cognitive science understanding of this disorder. OK. So I said we abandoned the single deficit model of dyslexia. And why did we abandon that? And I gave you some ideas. Uh, the biggest reason was that phoneme awareness deficits alone weren't sufficient to cause dyslexia. We found these kids with speech sound disorder, and others have too, who don't go on, who have phoneme awareness deficits and of the same magnitude uh, as dyslexics do, but didn't go on to be dyslexic. So they must have some protective factor that prevents them from becoming dyslexic. Um, that's point number four. There's some more stuff. Uh, we also found that learning rate or processing speed was important in dyslexia as well as phoneme awareness. Again, I'm going to show you some more on that. I'm not going to go into all the details of this. The last point is super important. We really need to understand much better why phonological development goes wrong in dyslexia. We know the problems start in infancy uh, from uh, high-risk studies of kids at family risk dyslexia. We know that they're, and they persist throughout preschool. So something is going wrong, something is different in a subtle way in the, the development of speech representations in kids with dyslexia. And we'd really like to know what that is, because that would be a target for early intervention. OK. What about ADHD? It looks like multiple cognitive factors also predict it. Uh, interestingly, one of the strongest predictors is this processing speed stuff I was telling you about, the coding and the symbol search. It comes in ahead of inhibition tasks like the stop signal task and the uh, CPT type tasks like the Gordon. So that's what inhibition means. Uh, SDRT is standard deviation and reaction time. So you notice that uh, it takes multiple things to explain symptoms of ADHD. It's not just one cognitive deficit. You'll also notice something else that's a big embarrassment for the ADHD field, uh, and that you don't explain that much of the variance in ADHD when you throw every single cognitive predictor at it. 
So if you look at the adjusted R squared over here, you know, we've used a bunch of things to predict uh, ADHD symptoms, variance in ADHD symptoms, and we've gotten up to a measly 30 percent. That's not very satisfactory. <laughs> And that is sadly probably true for just about any psychiatric disorder you can think of. Um, I haven't done the test, but, and maybe the autism folks will tell me, oh, we've done much better than that. But uh, the only disorder where we've done a lot better is dyslexia and maybe language impairment and some of those disorders. So where's the missing variance? This is a really important question. Uh, it, and we're trying to figure it out. I, it could be that psychiatric symptom inventories uh, are not ideal as targets for prediction because they're not normally distributed uh, traits. So when you have a psychiatric symptom questionnaire, you're focused on the presence of problems. You're not focused on good performance in the symptom dimension. Whereas the predictors, the cognitive predictors, are normally distributed, and they include both good and bad performance, right? So if you look at the distribution of ADHD symptoms, uh, it's not a nice normal curve. It's, if, let me get this right, this is good over here, and this is bad over here. It's like whoosh, massively skewed, and then a long tail and the ADHD kids are out here in the tail. But there's a lot of people that are in kind of a big hump out here which doesn't have much variance in it. You know, it's just not many symptoms. So if the target for predicting were better psychometrically and included good attention or good impulse control, maybe we would do better. Uh, and so we're starting to look at that. I think it's a very important question for the field. You know, you can't, you can't be happy as a neuropsychologist trying to explain some behavior if you can only count for 30% of the variance. But you can't be happy as a clinician either, right? You're talking to parents and saying the reason your kid has ADHD is because they have an inhibition problem. But by the way, you know, half of ADHD kids don't have that problem and it only accounts for <laughs> You know, that's not good. So I, this, I bring this up, I'm hoping some people in this room will help answer this problem. Um, okay, how do we look for shared cognitive risk factors across disorders? So how do we explain comorbidity using looking at shared cognitive risk factors? Uh, and here's some of the shared cognitive risk factors across the disorders I've been talking about. Uh, we published a study in 2011 in the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. And the first author was my graduate student, Lauren McGrath, who's now a, a professor at American, an assistant professor at American University. And she's in this cool program uh, in the education department that is trying to bridge between education and cognitive science. So she's really. Uh, acting as a bridging person across these fields. And there's starting to be actually something called education science, which is about time, I think. And uh, I think this is an important development for practice and for policy. Anyhow, she did this study with us where she used structural equation modeling to test for shared cognitive deficits. And so the way this sounds complicated, but uh, it's not that horrible. Uh, what you need are multiple measures of the constructs you're testing, and you have both symptom things that are outcomes, uh, like reading and inattention and hyperactivity, and then you have cognitive predictors like the things I've been talking about. Phonological awareness, work, verbal working memory, inhibition, processing speed. And you can see we have tons of measures of these things. And we do a factor, a confirmatory factor analysis to make sure that our guesses about uh, where these measures, what these measures, what construct they're a part of is actually true. In other words, in the confirmatory part, we want to see that the measures of inattention just load with other inattention measures and not with something else, you know, and so on and so on. And that held up. 
So that's the first step in this modeling process. And you end up with latent traits, which are good to work with because they don't have any error variance in them. So they're much better measures than uh, just a single task. Then the next step, once you have your constructs, both on the predictor side and the symptom outcome side, and these are symptom dimensions of reading and inattention and hyperactivity and impulsivity, and these are your cognitive risk factors over here, but they're continuous, or you could call them endophenotypes or whatever. Uh, the next step in the structural model is testing paths between the predictors and the outcomes. And what structural equation modeling does is it's a fancy uh, regression method. It figures out which paths are significant and account for unique variance in outcome. So it first puts in every possible path, and then it drops paths that don't add anything. And I put these, all of this in color to give you a hint about what's going to happen. So we have primary colors over here, and we have compound colors over here. So you may remember from kindergarten that red and blue make purple, and blue plus yellow make green. So you're going to see something like that uh, come up next. So when you do the structural modeling, then you get paths that are significant. So you can see not every possible path is in the model. Some of them didn't add variance. And you see that some things are only predictors of one disorder. They're just cognitive risk factors for one disorder. And some are affecting both. So as I've been telling you, phonemic awareness is a strong predictor of single word reading. That's consistent with tons of literature out there. But it's not a predictor of inattention or HI. Inhibition is a strong predictor of inattention and HI, like a lot of literature has already shown. But it's not a predictor of reading. So in that way, the two disorders are cognitively distinct. They each have some things that are cognitive risk factors that are specific to them, at least in this, we're not, you know, for these two disorders. Then some things are shared because the arrows are going to both outcomes. So processing speed motor is a shared risk factor for both reading and for uh, the symptoms of ADHD. And the really important test of whether this model uh, is, and this verbal working memory is gray, doesn't get to be a color, because it got wiped out by everything else. It doesn't mean that verbal working memory isn't associated with reading problems or with ADHD. It just means it's not uniquely associated once all these other predictors are in there. A lot of people go crazy when they see this result, because they really believe well, we know that working memory is part of these things. And yeah, you're right, it is. It's just that when phonological awareness is also in the model, it knocks it out, because they share a lot of variance. OK, so the acid test of whether this we've explained comorbidity at the cognitive level is whether uh, we have reduced the comorbidity or the correlation between reading and HI things. So before we did this model, these things were correlated at around 0.3 or 0.4. Once we put the predictors in, we have a residual correlation, which is really low now and is not significant. So we have accounted for the comorbidity with a shared cognitive risk factor. That's the, that's the bottom line point of this complicated study. But it's actually quite simple. It's a really, uh, it just means that uh, disorders that are comorbid, their comorbidity is partly due to shared cognitive risk factors, and once you control for those, you eliminate the comorbidity. You eliminate the correlation between them. Uh, you can see, so the zero order correlation between reading and inattention was pretty high, 0.435, and now we drop it down to 0.1. That's the point that we've explained the comorbidity. The other cool thing in here is because we're using latent traits, we're accounting a little bit more of the variance in ADHD 
and a lot of variance in RD. You know, we're, we, we have a successful cognitive model of reading disability. We don't have a successful cognitive model of ADHD, so that for reasons I tried to discuss, perhaps. We've pursued this at a genetic level. Uh, my former student and colleague, Eric Wilcutt, he, he did a behavior genetic study of the genetic relationship among these things, and that's called a Kolesky decomposition, but don't worry about that term. Just the logic's what's important here. Um, so if you have twins, you can model the uh, genetic variance that is specific to a given outcome and also model what's shared among the outcomes. And these genetic factors are uh, these things, these A additive one, A, these are just latent genetic traits, basically. Um, and then you put your outcomes over here, so you have two processing speed kind of measures. You have reading and attention and hyperactivity and impulsivity. What he found was there is a shared, there's a one risk, genetic risk thing that is accounting that goes to everything. And then there are genetic things that are specific, mainly specific, to one or two things. In other words, this shared deficit in processing speed is driven by or has an etiology of a, a some genetic set of genetic risk factors that affect everything. And then once you've got that in there, you don't have the comorbidity anymore. So the story is the comorbidity between reading disability and ADHD is explained by processing speed for the most part, and then, then that is mediated genetically for these two disorders that are both pretty heritable and that we know are genetically correlated. We already knew that to start with. So we have a story that runs from genes to cognitive risk factors to symptoms. And so now we've got a good explanation of a comorbidity. There's shared genetic risk factors for reading disability and ADHD. They partly act on a shared cognitive risk factor, and that accounts for a lot of the comorbidity. We don't know what the genes are, uh, and we'd like to find them, and we're working on that. Okay. So what about finding genes? Um, so this is the genetic methods part of the talk. Um, if we think about behaviorally defined disorders like dyslexia or ADHD or autism uh, or just about anything you can think of, schizophrenia, depression, and so forth, and then they are multifactorial. In other words, the risk factors that cause them are multiple genetic and environmental risk and protective factors. So your liability for these disorders is determined by your dose of all these different risk and protective factors. That's what multifactorial means. So these disorders are not like Fragile X syndrome, which is genetically defined and is wonderful to study because it has one genetic cause. These disorders have multiple, multiple uh, genetic and environmental risk and protective factors. So that's what this slide is showing. And then your polygenic or multifactorial load can also affect features of your disorder, like when it onsets and how severe it is and uh, what particular symptom profile you have. OK, so when we're studying something like dyslexia or ADHD or language impairment or speech sound disorder, we're trying to find what some of those risk factors, genetic and environmental risk factors are. And to do that, uh, we use genetically sensitive methods. Uh, first, we use behavioral genetic methods like twin studies to figure out uh, to what extent is the trait we're looking at heritable. And heritability is measured on a scale from zero to one that just says how much of the variance in this dimension is due to the effects, all the effects of genes. Doesn't tell us which genes they are, but it gives us an idea of how big the genetic effect is. Uh, if we find a genetic effect, we'd like to find where the genes are, and there's various ways of doing that. One used to be linkage. It's not used as much anymore. 
their candidate gene approaches, those got, have tons of problems. And then there's uh, now GWAS, which means genome-wide association studies. And then the last thing on here is just to remind you that the genes interact with the environment sometimes, so that sometimes the genetic and the environmental risk factors act together to determine outcomes. Okay, what do we know about genes for dyslexia? Well, dyslexia is multifactorial at the genetic level, or we could say polygenic. So through linkage studies, we found a number of parts of the genome that are associated reliably with dyslexia. So in other words, these are replicated across studies, and these are these red marks here. So these are genetic neighborhoods where there might be genes for dyslexia, or we think there are genes for dyslexia. And then with other techniques, we've honed in in these neighborhoods to actually identify candidate, and I say we in the very generous sense, but my colleagues have honed in on the neighbor, the genes in these neighborhoods. And one interesting thing about them is uh, some of these genes affect more than one disorder. So this is consistent with what I've been telling you, that part of the reason for comorbidity is shared genetic risk factors, right? So uh, these loci that are identified through linkage initially have these kind of names. Then they have a, a location on a given chromosome, so the chromosomes have numbers, and then the P and the Q are the different arms of the chromosomes, and then the numbers after that are particular bands or regions of that arm. So these are genetic locations. And then within those locations, people have used fine mapping studies to actually find candidate genes that are in that neighborhood. So this is a very famous uh, genetic breakthrough in the speech and language field, the FOXP2 gene, which uh, causes a rare form of verbal dyspraxia that's an autosomal dominant. And there's been tons of work on this gene in birds and all kinds of things. They're really cool stuff. Uh, but it is somewhat overlaps with these other things. Uh, there's a, a nearby gene called catnap that's also been implicated in reading disability. Uh, these things that were originally identified for language impairment over here are also implicated in reading disability. Um, we have some evidence that this dyslexia locus is implicated in speech problems. This is probably one of the strongest dyslexia candidates, but it's also implicated in these things and so on. So the emerging story, and it's far, far from complete, is that there are genes uh, that affect, that have been found for various ones of these comorbid disorders that are also now starting to show up as affecting more than one disorder. So, so again, the point is shared genetic risk factors help account for comorbidity. Okay, and ADHD is also very heritable. So what do these genes do that have been identified as candidate genes for dyslexia or reading disability? One of the things that's been found is they affect neuronal migration. And uh, this is kind of an exciting finding from the animal studies because it harkens back to a really early discovery in the field by Al Galiberta from autopsy studies on dyslexic brains that there were migrational defects in those brains. There were uh, neurons that hadn't migrated properly and were therefore what are called ectopias. Interestingly, there's an inherited disorder uh, called periventricular nodular heterotopia, who is defined by heterotopias, or mismigrated neurons, uh, that has a known genetic cause, but it produces reading problems. So you can go in the other direction. Um, this is to wake everybody up and remind you that we can't map complex traits directly onto single genes. Uh, just to be fair, I, my administrative assistant made one of these for women, so 
so back to the theory of science here for a little bit. So what is neuronal migration? It's a process by which baby neurons, uh, which are formed in the, close to the ventricles in the brain, make their way up to the cortex in the case of the formation of the cortex. And to do that, they have to uh, ride on these little trolley tracks that are provided by radial glial cells. Um, and so these glial cell extensions go all the way from the ventricular zone where the neurons are dividing, the baby neurons are dividing, all the way up to the cortex. And the baby neurons jump on these tracks and crawl along until, until they get to where they're supposed to go. And it's tricky because the neurons that uh, form the deepest layers of the cortex get there first, and the ones that form higher levels get there last, and so they have to go through each other and cause traffic jams and people getting off at the wrong exit on the freeway and stuff like that. So an ectopic neuron or a, a mismigrated neuron is one that doesn't get off in the right place okay. and may get off in white matter. So, and we, the, this effect on neuronal migration has been shown with RA interference in animal models uh, testing these genes. The other really cool recent discovery is there's a guy at the University of Texas in Dallas that's created a rat model of dyslexia by knocking down the expression of KIAO319 uh, and shown that this rat is bad at perceiving human speech. You, rats do perceive human speech, actually. They, their auditory system is good enough to distinguish human speech sounds. Their vocabulary is not as good. But uh, <laughs> And the rats with this uh, genetic defect that's found in dyslexia are worse at speech discrimination, but with very intensive training, He's shown, really, this is cool. He can improve the speech perception in these rats that have this genetic defect. So that's kind of an important clinical implication, that if we could find out which kids have these genes early, we could start intervening early to improve their speech perception. Um, this is just a picture of these ectopias in an actual brain from Galliburta stuff. Uh, this is some brain imaging stuff on white matter anomalies and dyslexia. So another thing, we know the brain's abnormal structurally and functionally in dyslexia. The abnormalities are mostly in the left hemisphere, and they include the white matter tracts in the left hemisphere. So this is just a uh, review article about that. This is a recent paper from Science from Betts, who found this connectivity problem in a functional study in dyslexia. He wanted to claim that this, the phonological stuff was intact, but just the connections were wrong. But we think the connections are what give you phonological representations. <laughs> that the, the, the connection between the auditory zone and the motor zone is what a phonological representation is, how those things work together. Uh, and then the genetic stuff has been now applied to imaging stuff so that you can type people for these risk genes for dyslexia um, and then image their brains and see if their particular genotype affects what you see on their anatomy. And so this is starting to cut across levels from genetic to brain to behavior, right? So here's the conclusions of the talk. Dyslexia is comorbid with these other things. Uh, for SSD, this relation uh, with ARD and ADHD is mainly mediated by language impairment. It takes multiple cognitive deficits to explain any one of these complex behavioral disorders. Uh, shared cognitive deficits help explain the comorbidity among disorders. And shared genetic risk factors seem to be also part of the explanation for the comorbidity. And then there's lots more that we need to understand. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. 
Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.